This episode of Chat with the Chatfields is brought to you by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements. Welcome to Chats with the Chatfields. This is a podcast to expand your idea of what impacts veterinarians, pet owners, and basically all animal lovers of the galaxy as humans. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Jen the Vet. And I'm Dr. Jason. And if you have not yet subscribed to our show, why not? Just go to chatfieldshow.com and subscribe today. If you want to reach us and you've got a message full of love and positivity, you can find me at Jen at chatfieldshow.com. And for all of you other folks who just want to keep it real, you can find me at Jason at chatfieldshow.com. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Jason, are you a little bit excited today? I'm super excited, even more than I uh, always am. I am. I'm excited as normal times 10. Okay. So uh, for all of you out there, for the uninitiated, uh, we are inviting an expert into the chat room today. Um, as per the use, yeah, that's but, the usual because yes. any one of us experts. No, no, no. Um, but we are inviting a very special guest because it is someone from the land of Dr. Jason. Yes, indeedy. It yes, is. indeedy, folks. It that's is. a very, that's a very, a very small landmass. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that we can get someone that admits to that is like we, we just get them on. It's fantastic. That's right. As soon as they commit, we say, "Great, now we got you." I want to record now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, so uh, let me tell you who this guy is because then I'm going to remind you he comes from the land of Dr. Jason, right? So um, joining <laughs> okay. us is a classmate of Dr. Jason from Texas A&M's College of Vet Med. They graduated together, and. Whoop! <laughs> oh no sorry I, i'm i'm still i still mess that up right i'm sorry I'm you do, sorry. You do. Sorry. okay <laughs> that's the aggie whoop yep um i did so it in the wrong place it's uh dr richard stone and he is um like he needs a bucket to carry around his letters and his title i think right Jason? Yeah, take a deep take a deep i'll talk you take okay. a breath and then you, you 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 there you go now now let us know what his title is okay so not only is he a dvm a veterinarian but he is a board specialist in small animal internal medicine which is i mean that's crazy town small animal internal medicine he's also currently the vice president of medicine at i gotta take another breath for this i know i was like you're running out of breath yeah. <laughs> he's the vice president of medicine at blue pearl specialists and emergency ca- pet care hospital no i i don't get it blue pearl why don't you just ask why don't you why don't we bring in richard and then okay. he can tell us exactly how we're supposed to say all that okay stuff. dr richard tell me the name again because we just call it blue pearl you bet a lot of people just call it blue pearl but that, the full <laughs> name is blue pearl specialty in emergency pet hospital no oh, thank you very much oh, emergency it rolls off the tongue of someone it that does works there, right? it does i think it means that whatever's ailing your pet whenever it's ailing them you can find dr stone and his team right that's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. But we're not going to talk about uh, pearls and emeralds and rubies and whatever your favorite gemstone is. Um, today, we want to talk about something that I have recently discovered to be acutely of interest, which is transfusions in pets. Right? Yeah, that's super awesome. And, and Dr. Stone is going to tell us all about it. We're going to ask him questions. He's going to let us know what's happening because everybody is sort of transfusions. If you've watched TV, you've heard about it, but probably you don't know the ins and outs of it. There's a little more detail than just like take some from A, put it in B, voila, Bob's your uncle. That's just not how it works, right? Well, actually, I think um, a lot or of people don't does. know. That's what I'm I, saying. Yeah. Oh, don't know what? That you can do this in, in animals? Yeah. Like. Oh, yeah. Like, like Dr. Stone, like, do you find that some like pet owners are like, wait, what? What do you mean we need a transfusion? Do y'all do that? That does come up. You know, we we see pets frequently, as I know a a number of veterinarians do, where they're ill for a variety of reasons. And sometimes one of those illnesses is anemia or a low red blood cell count. Okay. Depending upon how severe that is. Yeah. Right. Or how quickly it came on, they may need a transfusion. And, And when that conversation comes up, I would say at least half the time the client says, Wait a minute. How are you going to do that? Wow, where, where does really? That blood come from? Yeah, yeah. Half the time—that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, no, it's hard. Yeah. To be honest, it's hard for us, and I don't mean it's in any kind of 
you know, pejorative uh, from a, from way, ivory, yeah, any kind of bad way. But we, we live in this world or, or you guys do. But I used to live in the world, went to school anyways. Uh, so we just think it's a normal thing. But, you know, the most people, you know, maybe it's their first dog and they don't they don't it doesn't even cross their mind. So I, I, I it's hard for us to sort of uh, got to grasp at that. But that is interesting. It is it is half. It's half. No, I, it's crazy. I'll tell you, like at my emergency clinics, um, which was not a specialty hospital, to be sure. I had no boarded specialists running around. Um, it was special because you were there, Dr. Jen. Oh, thanks for that. Oh, <coughs> I'm coughing. You know why I'm coughing? <coughs> because we don't know. Doc- Dr. Jason's trying to blow some smoke at me. That's why. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. So uh, at any, any rate, um, I, I think people are concerned. And then if you think about it, then then you might wonder, well, wh- why would my pet need a transfusion? Do they need one right now? How would I even know? Right. And so and Dr. Stone threw out there, if you have a pet that's anemic, right, the red blood count is too low, which could happen quickly or slowly. But already, like pet owners, like, you know, most of their eyes are glazing over because they're like, Glazed over. Yeah. What does that even mean? And sh- how do I know? Um, and so I guess that's let's let's start there right um we're gonna start there we're gonna end with like some story you got to give me some dirt on some something silly or stupid that dr jason did in vet school i like so i would like some some ammo okay but um so let's start there right how if i'm a pet owner how do i know if my pet might need a transfusion or would i know you know, it's a great question. Uh, there's some subtle things that we can notice at home that might indicate that we're anemic, meaning our red blood cell count is low. And, and, and I think it's important to remind ourselves too, of like, what, why do we have red blood cells? What, what is the purpose, right? Wow. And, and in, for, for all of your listeners, it would be important to know that, hey, those red blood cells carry oxygen. You know, they've got a molecule, hemoglobin, inside of those cells circulating throughout the body that capture oxygen and deliver that to the tissues Mm-hmm. in the body. So pick up that oxygen in the lungs, deliver it to the tissues out in the body. Mm-hmm. And so we may notice subtle signs at home, like my pet is slowing down, is lethargic, you know, less active or less, less exercise tolerant. Mm-hmm. One of the big things we may notice though, is um, if you look at their gums, their gums no longer have that nice, healthy pink color. Mm-hmm. Understanding some pets have kind of pigmented, darker colored gums, but if they start losing that, that pink hue that we expect, um, that could be a sign. I, I was checking my gums because Dr. Stone said exercise intolerance was a sign. And I'm like, oh, that's got to be me. I was checking to see if I was. You're huffing anemic. and puffing. That's yeah. exercise yeah. intolerance. I was right? maybe I was anemic. Right? <laughs> you yeah, can't make okay it around the block. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stone. All right. <laughs> or they, or like, you know, when Cosette only bring wants to play fetch like twice, you know, I throw the farm fresh Frenchie Cosette when I throw the toy. And on the third time, she looks at me like, well, I'm not going to get it. You go get it. Um, is that ex- that's exercise intolerance? She is intolerant of the exercise. <laughs> <laughs> it could be behavioral. That could be behavioral, it right? Could, it could, um, yeah, it could also just be because she's the Frenchie. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But you bring up a good point, which is the stuff that I'm mentioning, the symptoms anyway, they, they could mean almost anything. So it's really important that if we see something like that, we have our primary veterinarian take a look, evaluate for any obvious mm-hmm. other causes for that. And if it leads them down the path of saying, whoa, I, I do think the gums are a bit pale. I think we need to do some lab work, some blood work to oh, see what your red cell count is. There right. You go. I was just right. going to say, this is a reason why when your veterinarian says to you, I need some more data, I need some more information, we need to do some blood work, find a way to say yes to that if you can, but realize that blood work is not going to fix your pet, right? It's right. just going to help us determine what you need. And one of those things could indeed be a blood transfusion, right? Um, so, so if you only have ten shekels, you know, make your veterinarian aware of that, so you don't spend nine of them on blood work, and you only have one left, and you can't pay for the treatment, right? So, <clears throat> so we we got to know that up front. Okay, so spend your shekels wisely, whatever whatever that yeah. is. Well, yeah. because it doesn't really matter. There's never there's never right. enough, like you know, and that's a legitimate concern. Mm-hmm. I think right. that people need to need to recognize that your veterinarian, at least if like, if Dr. Jen, the vet is your vet, like, I don't care. I'm not judging you based on how much you're going to spend on your pet. You're already a good owner because you didn't have to show up, right? You didn't have to walk through the doors at the Blue Pearl veterinary, no, the Blue Pearl specialty and emergency care pet hospital, right? Almost. No, 
No? Okay. So close. I know. Well, so the, close. Place, the place that I see pets is a lot easier. It's just New Tampa, uh, New Tampa Animal Hospital. It's a lot easier. Right. But of course, of course, we don't have a bunch of specialists running around either. Um, okay. So, so you walk in the room or the vet walks in the room and says, we need a transfusion. So the next question Dr. Jason had, which was great, which is, where are you going to get the blood from? And wait, Dr. Stone, I know you have an answer for that. Dr. Jason has an answer. We're going to get both of those answers, but we're going to get them after the break. Okay. So everybody hang tight. We're coming back to talk about now what happens. Now, you know, your pet needs a transfusion. What happens? All right. We'll see you on the other side. It's Dr. Jen, the vet. And I'm here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Keith Latson. He's got an incredibly interesting story all about full bucket health. My college roommate and vet school housemate, Dr. Rob Franklin and I were collaborating on some cases. Both of us were struggling with diarrhea in some of our patients, whether it was after a procedure or after, after an illness. So we created a formulation, but we didn't want to just create a formulation. We also wanted to create a movement in animal health for being able to help animals in need through the use of our products that we develop. That really has resulted in our one-for-one -one giving program, which we're re really proud of, as much as we are our formulations for dogs, horses, and cats. And so if you wanna know more about their one-for-one -one giving at Full Bucket, or if you're interested in better supporting your dog, cat, or horse's digestive health, head over to fullbuckethealth.com to learn more. All right, well, let's see what's happened in the world of bees. These View from Vet School, brought to you by the AVMA Trust. Veterinarian-inspired coverage, protecting you through it all. This is a public service announcement regarding VEMCAS, which stands for um, Veterinary Medical Class. No, wait. College Application Specialist? No, wait. That's not right. Either. Services. Services. So Veterinary Medical College Application Services, or VEMCAS, is how pretty much everyone applying to vet school will be required to do so. And I wanted to inform everyone listening of this process for some helpful guidance or just fun tidbits and info. I am sure everyone out there assumed being smart and hardworking was all you needed to be to get into vet school. You would be wrong. Because along with navigating and completing all of your prerequisites for whichever program you decide you're interested in, you also will have to be savvy enough to navigate and complete the VEMCAS application system, which is fairly difficult actually. Most veterinary schools now use VEMCAS for their application process, but fear not, VEMCAS has wonderful customer service individuals, so utilize them. There's a number right on the screen when you go in there. Let's talk timeline. So VENCAS opens January 15th-ish. It may vary from year to year, but it's in January. For you to begin adding information to your application. This does not mean you can submit your application at that time, but it's a pretty long process and you're gonna wanna be able to get everything in in a timely manner. Then around June or July, you'll be able to actually submit your application to whichever schools you choose to. The benefit of VENCAS is you can apply to multiple schools with this one application, but beware, you may also have to complete an application with the school and there may be additional application fees with the individual school. The applications are usually due around September 15th, so that seems like a lot of time from January to September or even from June or July to September, but that time sneaks up on you, especially when you have to get all your transcripts set and your letters of recommendation and everything else. I hope that public service announcement was helpful to everyone or informative. Thanks for listening. I'm V and that's my view. Want to share your view? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Or do you have questions about vet school? Send it to me at info at chatfieldshow.com. V's View from Vet School, brought to you by the AVMA Trust. Veterinarian inspired coverage, protecting you through it all. Okay, and we're back. And still in the uh, chat room with us is Dr. Richard Stone. Uh, we're talking all about blood transfusions in pets because it's a thing. Uh, and so before the break, I said that, um, like, imagine yourself where the veterinarian has just come in and they said your pet needs a transfusion. Um, 
And I guess I should say we, we didn't really finish like why. So they could have been like hit by a car. They could have um, had a, a dog fight. And they could just be sick. Yeah, I think, um, I think anything that, can, that, that causes a major blood loss is, is the primary reason uh, for. Yeah, for, they could also have right. a weirdo, not weirdo, but less common autoimmune disorder where their body's um, immune system is attacking the red blood cells, right? Like that- That's right. You know, you bring up a good point, which is like, if we talk about anemia, that there's multiple causes for it. And the uh-huh. transfusion can help us in the short term, stabilize the situation, but we still need to understand why did the anemia occur? Why don't we have enough red blood cells in circulation? And your categories are right. Could be blood loss, right? There was some sort of trauma event or gastrointestinal bleeding or something like that, or or it could be hemolysis, which means the red blood cells are actually being destroyed in circulation. They're not being lost, they're being destroyed. And that could be caused by certain infectious diseases. It could be caused by the immune system attacking its own body. It could be caused by certain toxins, guys. Remember, like pennies, oh, yeah. right? Pennies have a lot of zinc in them. And if, if a dog eats a, a, a penny, that zinc just gets unloaded in gastric acid, mm-hmm. goes into the circulation and destroys red cells. So Blood loss or hemolysis, those are the two big categories for why I might very quickly go from having plenty of red blood cells to having not enough. Now I'm anemic and I need a transfusion. What about zinc? I mean, what about, sorry, nickels? Because I thought, nickels. The, I thought, is it zinc that's in the penny or is it copper that it's, causes the thing? Well, it's both. There was a particular year, which I can't remember off the top of my head, where they shifted from um, going. Oh my gosh, you're fired. Copper penny. <laughs> Come on. I, I thought you up. were an expert. What you don't know the year they changed it was in the composition 1970s. of pennies. Well, right. we'll go with the seventies. So the, the pennies went the from 70s. being all copper. Well, uh-huh. now they're zinc. Now they're predominantly oh. zinc and that's a big deal. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So not only are they eating your money, literally, then you got to pay to take care of them because they ate your money. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. Oh my gosh. Cosette is lucky. She's cute. Uh, okay. So, so, so any of those reasons you could find yourself standing there across from the vet at the exam table and they're saying, Hey, we need to transfuse them. Right. And, um, just, just for like the sake of thoroughness, the reason, like what's the measurement that they're going to tell us is too low. Ah, great question. So there's a couple of different terms you might hear thrown out there. Um, If you're sitting across from the veterinarian and they're telling you your pet's anemic, they may mention red blood cell count. Mm -hmm. They may mention hematocrit. Ding, ding, ding. That's the one I like. That's the one you like. You're going to hear that from me. (laughs) Yeah. Or they may mention packed cell volume. Oh, and that one. Yeah. Right. And so hematocrit and packed cell volume, they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close. And, And basically what it means is if I look at a volume of blood, it's a mix of red blood cells, white blood cells, platelet cells, and then a bunch of fluid, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanna know how much of all of that, all of that volume of blood is actually red blood cells. And for a normal dog, let's say, it's gonna be somewhere in the range of 35 to almost 50% mm-hmm. percent of that blood volume is made out of red blood cells. So if they come to you and say, look, the hematocrit is 19%, or the pack cell volume is 20%. What they're saying is you have far fewer red blood cells comprising your blood than you normally would. And, and that's why we need to do the transfusion. Right. Yeah, right. it's too Perfect dilute. Sense. It's too dilute. Right. It's like when exactly. you make tea with it with your tea bag, right? Like can you, you can make, make it really weak or you can actually open the tea bag up and make it sludgy if you want to, um, because that's also another problem, right? Like if it's too, we have too many red blood cells. So that's a whole different issue. That's another episode, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and right. so, yeah. So, okay. So it's too diluted. We don't have enough red blood cells to carry the oxygen. Um, we need a transfusion. So Dr. Jason. Oh, finally. I mean, you tease, I had an answer <laughs> like 20 minutes ago and I've been ready like my hand, like the like core shack, right? Yeah. Ooh, 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 I'm ready. I'm ready. I got this one. Okay. I got it. So I asked a question. I think, I think I know what you're going to ask. I think I actually have a, a decent answer. So I used to get this in the emergency clinic all the time when I would say, ah, we got to do a blood transfusion. The owners would be like, where are you going to get that? Right. Where are you get all right. That blood? I'm ready. I'm ready for my big answer. In, I, in I the human it. world, where do they get it? Jason, where do they, where are yes, you going to get you. it? My guess is they're going to get it from another animal. An unsuspecting 
Uh, I don't have any idea, but they're going to get it from another animal. Like if it's a dog, they're going to get it from a dog. Versus a plant? Yes. I mean, like another animal? Yes. Stop okay. making fun of my answer, all right? I'm pretty sure. Richard, this is, is it, the answer. Did, did you carry him through vet school? Is this what's yes, happening? Yes, he did. Let's move on. <laughs> you will never admit it. 100% <laughs> Richard carried me through vet school. Oh, God. Woo. Okay. Secrets out. I'm Secrets pretty sure out. Okay. Yeah. All right. Dr. Stone. Where are you going to get the blood? Well, it, it is true that the blood comes from another animal. And yes, right. the All species right. was correct. It yes. is a dog. It is right. a dog, right? Yes. But there's a lot that goes into um, how we collect that blood. How do we get that blood? Because we don't just randomly go to another patient and mm-hmm. say, okay, we need some blood, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's a process by which we collect blood, just like, I mean, we're used to seeing this on the human side. Mm-hmm. Right? Richard, Richard I'm gonna, can I stop you for just a second? Yeah. I know you're about to get into it and, and I hate, and I, I hate yeah. doing this to you, but I want, I want to clarify something. I was watching The Walking Dead the other day. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's super true, right? This is definitely the zombie apocalypse situation. So, you know, it's true. Yeah. They literally took a tube, stuck it in somebody's neck and then ran the blood right to the other person's you know, other, other jugular, I guess. I don't really know where they put it, but any of the other person, isn't that not what happens? Same so thing, right from body to body. I, hey, there may be something about zombie blood that I don't know about, um, but that's no, not no, no, exactly no. how it's It done, wasn't right? zombie not a, blood. Not a zombie. It, zombie. Was, it, was it was just on the walking dead. Oh, but it was okay. two humans, yeah? So okay. that doesn't, okay. doesn't happen that way, right? So yeah. done yeah. differently. It's okay. done differently than that. I'll be quiet. Well, and listen. But wait that's a second. But wait a second. I mean... It may not be right, but it's not wrong. Like, because that's how they started doing it with people first, right? They just hook you up to another person. Of course, it didn't turn out well for the other person every time, like depending on <laughs> how much they took. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you, you can do it that way. That's less than ideal. Okay, so Dr. Stone, we well, can get it from another dog. <laughs> We can get it from another dog. And, and, you know, there are actual blood banks. You know, we see this on the human side. We're very familiar wow. with, okay, you know, the big bus or van pulls up and they have all the equipment right. and people donate blood. And then the blood mobile. Yeah. yeah, right. And you get well, a t-shirt and some orange juice. You get a t-shirt, orange juice uh, and some a orange cookie. juice, maybe, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe a cookie. Yeah, right. There's that. Um, on the veterinary side, the, the way, like the nuts and bolts of how this works is we, we would have a pool of donors, a group of donor pets, Okay. And that we can get into how the blood is taken and all of that. It's, it's actually not very dramatic. It's, it's actually uh, very, very well tolerated. But the point is, we collect the blood from uh, healthy donors. Okay. Okay. Healthy, that's the other thing. Donors. He said yep. the word healthy. Like, I'm wondering about diseases. Like, how do I know that you're not going to give my pet a disease from that blood? Great call. So you have to screen that blood. So there's mm-hmm. some things we want to know. We want to know that the, the pet is healthy, pet is free of disease. And there's a, there's a, a list of different diseases that we test for, that we screen for from our donors before we even collect their blood. Right. And yeah, there's actually like heartworm and tick, tick diseases. diseases. I'm going to guess mainly bloodborne diseases, bloodborne diseases. All right. Look at that. All right. (laughs) You got it. You got it. (laughs) I think I'm following, picking up what you're laying down here. Let's go. No, you got it. But, but even just their overall health has to be good as well. In addition to all that investigation we do to make sure they don't have any bloodborne diseases, the, the donor's overall health has to be good. So usually we're looking at relatively younger adult dogs, larger dogs, because they have a bigger blood volume and right. they're mm-hmm. free of diseases because they've been screened. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, so we're going to, we're going to get the blood and then, but um, in, in humans, we know there's different types of blood, right? There's a B there's a B and then there's like, Oh, and then every there's positive and whatever. Are there different blood types on dogs or does it not matter? It does matter. It's a great question. So there are different blood types. It sounds a little bit different in dogs versus people. Um, we use these, the, the nomenclature we use, the names we use is DEA and it's DEA 1.1, DEA 1.2, DEA 4. You can go down the list, but the DEA part stands for dog erythrocyte antigen. Okay. Oh, not drug enforcement. <laughs> yeah, that's what Jennifer, Jennifer, you said DEA. She got a little worried there. She's like, wait, what? What's happening here? But just, and just to clarify, erythrocyte is another fancy word for red, red blood cell. Exactly. Okay. Whew, that's close. Yeah. Nailed it. Nailed okay. It. Nailed it. Good show. Jason remembers that. I was out on a limb there for a second. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, so there's different types of blood, um, in dogs. We haven't even talked about cats. Ooh, good point. 
cats it's because they're, they're just small dogs. Let's move, move on. No, no. Here, is that not right? Here on no. chats, we know that cats are not just small dogs. No, but we we also know that Frenchies are cats, kind of. But yeah, okay, yeah, they are. Anyhow. Okay, so what about cats? Because cats have all the same risks for the need of a, of a mm -hmm. blood transfusion. Um, is it the same? Could you do dog to cat or cat to dog? You can't, right? Good. No, good question. Good question. So cats do also have blood types and their, their naming system is more similar to humans. There's type A and type B and, and cats are exquisitely sensitive to getting, they have to get the right kind of blood um, cat to cat. So uh, uh, the predominant type that we see in the United States is, is type A. There are some A unique breeds. Shock. Well, right. <laughs> type B. Uh, I think you mean Cat something else. Uh, well, uh, cats are exquisitely sensitive. All right. And they have to have type A. And oh, they're type A. Shock, right? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, right. Well, there are some cats that are type B. You know, we think of some of the more exotic breeds, Persians, cats like that. There, there's a subset, maybe 2% that are, that are type B. Cats are very sensitive with respect to their immune systems if they get the wrong kind of blood, cat to cat. That being said, there is a such thing as what we call a xenotransfusion, which means blood from one species going to another species. And you, in theory, in a pinch, if we didn't have the right match of blood, you can, I know this sounds outrageous, you can give dog blood to a cat if it was a life-threatening emergency, but we prefer not to do that. We prefer to give type A blood to a type A cat, type B blood to a type B cat. Can you imagine, zombie right, zombie apocalypse. Can you imagine the cat like waking up or like realizing like you totally say, the blood we gave you was from a dog. That cat would be so ashamed, right? <laughs> no. Like, oh my God, oh, oh, it's a dog <laughs> Get it out of me. I want no part of you in me. That's this is right. <laughs> I can only imagine. Um, so, okay. So I think that's interesting because uh, when you talk about a xenotransfusion, um, because recently I had reason to become acquainted with the historical um, event and transfusion medicine. Uh, short article. Can you let us in on, on like, yeah. that's really cool. Dr. Stone is talking about, I mean, I, I don't know how recent this is. This could be 20 years. It could be five years. I don't know. How often, how long have we been doing this, right? How long has in humans, pets, whatever, has have we been doing sort of transfusions like a forever? Long, like, like a long time. Like, hundred years or yeah, what? Like, like a couple really? centuries. Yeah. Because Holy cow. Well, because I mean, they recognized uh, back back in the day, you know, a couple centuries ago, that people recognized, hey, blood's important uh, with compatibility with life. Okay. Huh. You know, like you sort of need that. And so <clears throat> they would uh, transfuse people from other people. Um, but first, they tried transfusing people with lamb's blood um, and they had some success, right? So like there were mm. six people they wrote about. I think only four of them died. Oh, good. Yeah, that's two, two out of six ain't bad, I guess, right? Right. If um, you're, then, you're one of those two. Yeah, and then they, they transfused people from other people. Um, but then sometimes the donor died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a Mac, you can't exsanguinate them while you're trying right. to save the other person. Although when back in those days, remember, there was like a severe class distinction, right? So it'd be like the servant class. And so right. they'd be like, well, we'll get another one. Get um, another one. Yeah. yeah I mean, people did horrible things to other people um, right. in the history of the planet. And then <clears throat> after that, like, because people, there were such horrible outcomes, they banned it globally. So we went a long time with nothing. But then they had the bright idea to transfuse people with, wait for it, milk. Ah, have you ever heard of that, Dr. Stone? Milk? I think I did read that on the internet one time on, on like Instagram or something, but I didn't really believe it. But you're telling me it's true? Mm -hmm. It's Dr. real. Jen? Dr. Stone, you ever heard of that? Should we question her on that? I have not heard of that. That sounds Can you crazy. imagine how that would go, right? Hey, just don't worry about that. I'm going to put this. Listen, you drink milk when you're a baby, so it makes perfect sense. I'm going to put some more milk inside of you mm -hmm. to save but, your life. Well, but like in the early 1900s, they thought milk was a great medicinal thing, right? They thought milk cured TB. Right. Even though actually milk was the source of the TB infection. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> anyway, uh, so I'm sure like 50 years from now, they're going to say some of the stuff that we do medically is crazy town. Right. 
Um, but anyway, that's the only stuff that you do. But listen, that's they, all interesting. It's super yeah, cool. They cleaned very, it up. Very good brief history situation. Thank, thank um, you. Thank I, you. I, it's, it's, Welcome. Let's get it back out of the weeds there. Okay. Back to on point here because we had a couple of things mentioned that I'm very yeah. interested in learning about. One being blood banks for animals. Yeah. I think that's super cool. I don't know if we were finished. I think we're finished with the blood typing and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You think so? All right. Well, but the other thing probably has the other hours thing, and hours of this stuff. Yeah, but the other thing I think that um, pet owners should be aware of is that like there's, because there can be adverse reactions, right? That's why I'm saying they right. killed people when they would do transfusions because your if your body reacts to foreign proteins, right? And so um, your veterinarian, if they're going to transfuse your dog, is going to prepare your dog or your cat right? Like me, I'm not as fancy as Dr. Stone. Um, I'm not an internist. I give him steroids. Um, <laughs> and oh, Benadryl. <laughs> he's going to, better not Look, he's gonna hang up. He's dude, like, I love steroids. steroids are good when used appropriately. When right? used appropriately. That's right. They're not evil. They hold no ill will. Right. <laughs> um, and Step so down off the soapbox. Let's yeah, roll, roll on. Well, cause you know, it's like some younger veterinarians will word, be like, right? Oh, <gasps> But steroids, right. you know, sorry, steroids are helpful in many situations, including when you're trying to tamp down an adverse reaction to oh, a blood steroids. transfusion. Yeah. So what are you pre-med with, Dr. Stone? What do you think? You know, pre-med is a great question, a great topic to tackle, because there's some controversies about whether to pre-med or not to pre-med. I'll tell you, when you mentioned the, the preparing for a blood transfusion, there's a few things worth pointing out. Like one, for the donor, we make it extremely safe, right? We, we, we are very, very strict with the volume of blood that we can collect, right? How much they can donate to the point where we're actually weighing it with a gram scale. We're not just going based on the volume, wow. we're weighing it as we go to make sure wow. that we're taking out precisely the safe amount, okay? And then before we do the transfusion, the, the recipient, the, the, the patient that needs the blood, we need to understand, okay, what is their blood type? And then we can actually do a cross match and say, okay, I'm gonna take a little bit of your your, your blood, basically your serum as, as the one that's going to receive it. And then I can take some of the, the blood from the donor and do this sort of cross match scenario where I understand how's this blood going to behave in your body. But okay, I can but do that. On can you just, yeah. Just tell people what that looks like. Cause look, he's making it sound super fancy. I take a drop of the, the serum mm -hmm. from the one dog. I take some blood from the other dog and I put them together and mix them up on a slide and look and see if they clump. <laughs> pretty much. I mean, that, that's pretty accurate. We want to know if it's going, if it's going to cause um, immediate hemolysis or, you know, is, is the, the, the patient that needs the blood, is their body going to destroy these red blood cells as soon as we give it to them? Yeah. Or is it going to cause agglutination where the, 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 the cells stick together like you're mentioning? Mm -hmm. So yes, we want to do that beforehand so that we know it's going to be safe. Now, some people do still premedicate um, prior to giving blood. They premedicate the recipient, right? With things like Benadryl and steroids. Some do not. We just, we start at a, a, a very um, closely calculated rate and then may progressively increase the rate over time. But the whole time we're doing a transfusion, we monitor for signs of allergic reaction. We monitor for signs of fever, um, sometimes intestinal upset. And we monitor for signs of, of hemolysis. There's that word again, which means destroying of the red blood cells. So we monitor for all of that the whole time the transfusion is being given. Yeah, I, I do all of that, right? Like I start it slow, mm -hmm. you know, for the first 15 minutes staring at them because everyone knows if you're staring at them, they won't have a problem. <laughs> and uh... <laughs> don't, don't blink, right? Don't, don't blink. blink. Yeah. It's true. It's true. In emergency medicine, that's why I want to be able to see all the pets all the time because nothing dies while you're staring at it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, start it slow, but I do give a little steroid. So is it wrong if, if your vet, it gives a little bit of steroids or Benadryl before the transfusion? No, I don't think it's wrong at all. I, I think the scenario is, you know, we're in this place in veterinary medicine where over time we're gathering evidence, we're gathering data mm -hmm. and, and we, we call that evidence-based medicine. You know, what, what proof do I have that this is helpful? What proof do I have that this is harmful? And this is one of those areas where maybe there's more data to be collected. So people may take a different path there. Some will premedicate, some won't. I don't think either path is wrong. I think the important part is if we see that a patient is reacting negatively to a blood transfusion, we're monitoring and we're prepared to intervene if we need to. Many patients do very, very well though. If they're, mm -hmm. if they're in a position where they need a transfusion, we do our, our blood typing and cross matching and then we, we administer it in an appropriate manner. 
it can be life-saving for those patients. So I have a question uh, real quick for, for because we, you guys are just saying this, and it's something that, that, that seriously, I, I really, everything to TV, because everybody watches TV, I'm sorry. So, hey, I got this blood type, I got that blood type, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. How, is there a test? Like, can you just do that in the clinic? Because they have a, a pretty, like, a, a pretty simple test. Hey, you take a blood, you know, this is going to be type A, or do you just strictly do the cross-match? Uh, um, deal. Do you do both? You, do, are you able to blood type the, the patient, both of them, like right yes. in-house? Oh man, right. that's, pretty, that's pretty cool, right? You can. There's some simple desktop kits that you can use to get yeah. the blood type. And, and there's part of the reason why we want to do this is when we talk about blood transfusions and we talk about the, the, the blood banking, there's this concept of quote unquote universal donor blood, right? right? right. That's DEA 1.1 negative, 1.2 negative. But there's a whole population of dogs that are um, DEA 1.1 positive that could be donors, that could be donors, but their blood is only good to go to another DEA 1.1 positive dog. So there is a time where it's valuable to um, not only cross match, but but blood type our recipients, because if it's a DEA 1.1 positive dog, well, I might have DEA 1.1 positive blood that I can give them. So it just expands my pool. Oh, then you don't waste like the universal one that you may need for another dog, you know, at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Is there a universal donor for cats? You know, cats are tricky in that you've got to, you have to do your homework on that patient every time, Mm -hmm. meaning we we have to know what their blood type is. Mm -hmm. And ideally we cross match as well because cats are so reactive. Now, when we get into the topic of reactive, what we're talking about is those allo antibodies, the antibodies that are already there in circulation, ready to destroy a transfusion if administered. Type B cats, some of those, those type B breeds are, are far more sensitive to being given the wrong blood and will have an immediate and, and actually could be fatal reaction. Like it could be very, very serious. Yeah. Um, so we always blood type cats because we don't want to be surprised yeah. and find that we have a type B patient. Yeah. And I guess that's so, so what I, when I remember learning about transfusions was, cause you know, I, I just remember broad things, Dr. Stone, you remember details and I get the broad strokes and um, the broad strokes were, you can get away with a, a single transfusion in a dog and you'll probably be okay. Like, Correct. yeah, your second transfusion got to be a little, got to be a little, a little more, more heads right? up. Yeah. But with a right. cat, you cannot, they could die on the first transfusion if you don't do it right. That's right. That's right. Dogs tend to not have high titer, allo antibodies. I mean, they don't have a ton of antibodies already in existence. So if mm-hmm. I had, if my own pet, if Chuck was involved in a Chuck? traumatic event, old Chuck, if, if he got Chuck. hurt and he was anemic and I had to give him a transfusion, but there was no time. Yeah. If I had no time to do typing and cross matching, I would confidently give him DEA 1.1 negative blood. Mm -hmm. we call it universal donor blood. And I would be confident that he wouldn't have a reaction. Now, the key here is when we have rescues, we don't always know if they've had a transfusion before or not. Right. Right. hundred percent. Unknown history. Unknown unknown history. history. That's right. Yeah. So that's true. So it's another reason to be very upfront and honest with the veterinary staff about your pet and what you know and what you don't know about them. Even though you've had them for 10 years, they didn't have them for the first two or three. Right, and so right. who knows what they may have gone through. So that's a great point about Richard, the unknown history. You live in this world more than more, certainly more than I do. Uh, that's for sure. So how, I'm just curious, how often, uh, you know, do you do cat transfusion? We keep bringing it up, but is it, is it pretty rare or is it like half and half or, or what? It, it, I would say, do you, have, not- do you have any kind of idea really? I mean, I don't it, know. It would be a rough estimate just based on my right. own anecdotal right. experience, but I would say, it's, it happens far less frequently than in dogs, but it happens with regularity, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, to give you kind of a scale of things, just even in our own hospitals, we give, uh, somewhere on the order of 10,000 transfusions annually to to dogs and cats combined. A vast majority of those go to dogs. Right. Okay. Uh Probably nine out of 10 plus. Um, but it happens with enough frequency in cats that in that kind of environment, if you're in, in an emergency room or specialty hospital, you often will have um, cat blood on hand Mm -hmm. from, Mm -hmm. you know, that you, you obtain from, uh, from a blood bank so that you're ready in the event that a cat needs it. So speaking of blood banks, I told you guys, I think I I found that very interesting because I remember uh, not to bring up uh, too much past, but I I worked at a clinic uh, while before I was in vet school. Wait a minute. Uh, Wait a minute. Did you and Dr. Stone maybe work at the same clinic before vet school? 
Yeah, we did. It, 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 was, uh, it was actually an interesting story. We don't probably have time for it, but we were different shifts. Like, we didn't really yeah. know each other, right? Yeah. I was like, oh, that guy. He's like, oh, who's that guy? Uh, and then it turns out we got into the same, I mean, seriously, the same clinic. I would walk in uh, in the morning. Richard would walk he would, out? He would, he would know, he, pretty much, but at lunch, <laughs> I would walk out. He would walk out. We just didn't really, yeah. really talk much. It was a crazy thing. And then in vet school, we ended up somehow sitting next to each other. I'm like, aren't you that guy from... You know, yeah. like, yep, that's me. I'm like, dude, oh anyways, we crazy. have to give a shout out to Van Stavern, to Dr. Van Stavern. I didn't know if we could, man. Van Stavern, Neil Van Stavern, and Van Stavern's Small Animal Hospital was fantastic yes. Uh, yes. for me and and I'm assuming for Richard. But yeah, big that's shout right. out. And we'll send him a copy of this, right? We for will. Sure. We definitely cool. sending a link to the Van yeah. Stavern. They can put and- it on the loop. And I'm sure he's got TVs everywhere because I used to watch the Golf Channel every day. Yes. Uh, yes. Anyways. Anyhow. So listen, so at, back in the day, right? Yeah. Back at, This is a long time ago now. They used to have a clinic dog I, mm-hmm. I i don't know if, i mean he would just use i think his dog from home but basically a lot of one of the boxers have, yeah exactly <laughs> uh could that like okay i got a transfusion i'm gonna go draw blood from this dog do my testing and then give it to mm-hmm. the next dog and you guys are saying that's there's so much more involved and invest so much more with blood transfusion there are actually blood banks mm-hmm. where you can I don't, order it is that the right word right. or you right. store it in house so you just have it right that is that's super cool actually right. if you ask me you know, there's, there's, so all of the above that you mentioned could be appropriate, right? You could have, um, as the, the, the veterinarian or the staff could have um, large breed dogs that have been screened, that are right. healthy, that are not anemic, right? That would be appropriate donors. And that's, that's actually fine. You can actually do the collection in a veterinary hospital. And um, depending upon how you're going to utilize that blood, it can be stored for a while as well, refrigerated. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, the other scenario that we, we run into is in, in some of our specialty hospitals, we will have a local sort of blood banking operation that we utilize so that we can have a larger quantity of blood. And then if you look at it on a national level, there are national blood banks that, that do mm-hmm. just this, that yep. um, have donors that come in, they collect, and then they can do different things with the blood, which is really interesting. It can be, you can have fresh whole blood, you can have um, packed red blood cells, you can have plasma, you can mm-hmm. have very specific plasma type products. So you, you can divide that blood out based on what the liquid is and what the red blood cells are to treat different types of patients. Yeah. So blood component therapy is, yeah. um, so it's a little bit more sophisticated, right? Because if you don't need everything that's in blood, all of the pieces, white blood cells, red blood cells, the proteins, the serum, if you just need red blood cells, then you, you can just transfuse with red blood cells and that's called About packed cells. Yeah, super right. awesome. Right. Yeah. Because you're very you, sophisticated. Yeah. Now it doesn't make it wrong to do a whole blood transfusion. And I'm going to, I've been waiting to ask this question, Dr. Stone, because, <laughs> okay. well, because, because he's a specialist and right. I'm not. And so I, <clears throat> I think I remember hearing this and I don't know if it's true. Um, well, it's not necessarily wrong to provide a whole blood transfusion in the face of, um, simple anemia. Um, is it true that there's very few true indications for whole blood? Rather, the indication is more um, distinctly for blood components? It's a great question. So in a scenario where, let's say I had a patient that had anemia from blood loss, okay? There was some sort of trauma event. Hit by car. Bleeding, hit by car, right. And they've got wounds and they've been bleeding from the wounds. They both have anemia, so their total red blood cell count in their body is low now because they've mm-hmm. bled, right. but they are also hypovolemic, meaning the, right. the, just the total volume of fluid in circulation is down. In that scenario, fresh whole blood could be very appropriate, right? Because it's it's they lost everything. Volume. It's right? got everything. Like right. the, the vein was opened and it was bleeding out on the ground, right? That's yeah. I think what people but, think of. Right. right. Typically, yeah. So it or, could be appropriate there, but then there's a lot of uh, anemia scenarios where we don't need the whole blood. Yeah. We just need those packed cells as you described. And in that scenario, that's preferable for me because some of the patients I treat with anemia, um, they may actually not tolerate a large fluid load. Right. It might be an advantage for me to have that more concentrated right. blood product. Just give them what they need instead of giving them the whole blast, right? That's right. Could it, could it be considered more risky to give? Like, well, okay, I, I think of stuff as less is more. And so if I don't have to give so I'm, I'm okay. We're putting stuff into the body. Like that's right. always, it's always a risk and it's always, it's always, you know, hey, got to worry about some stuff. Right. So I guess, it, is, it, is it right to say it's less risky to give, uh, you know, less is more? I mean, is it, is it, is it a little, little bit less of a risk to give just what you need rather than everything? 
You know, it, this is sort of reaction. It's a turn. No, of I, the, the way I think about it, from the standpoint of the major reaction that's going to happen, it's how the the recipient's body, the sick right. patient, how their body is going to respond to those red blood cells. Are they going to let the red blood cells survive? Mm -hmm. or are they going to attack them? I think that's a risk with either right. fresh whole blood or packed red blood cells. Right. But the less is more question really comes down to when we're giving a blood transfusion, what is our goal? Our, our goal in that moment is to stabilize our patient, right? Not necessarily to get all the way back to normal, but mm -hmm. to get our red blood cell count to a safer place while we treat whatever the underlying problem is. Yeah. And I think that's a good point because there's so many variables, right? Because there's so many things that can happen that cause you to arrive at that point where you're standing there and they're saying your pet needs a transfusion and right. nothing happens in a vacuum. We're like, we're focused on the transfusion piece of it, but maybe they have um, heart disease that you've been managing. So they can't right. handle a lot of fluid load. Right. Maybe yeah, they've got point. kidney um, involvement. Maybe there's a toxin on board that's causing mm -hmm. all sorts of weird derangements, including the anemia. And so, so you, you have to be careful. Right. Dr. Jen, you're telling us, and Dr. Stoney tells us we have to take the whole patient <gasps> into consideration, right? Is that what yeah. you're saying? You got to look at the whole that's patient, right. not just, not just these numbers on a chart, right? So that's, right. that's a good point. So everybody has to be aware of that. The client has to be aware mm -hmm. of that. Obviously the veterinarian's already aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, just so for everybody, why am I not getting whole blood? Why am I only getting a little bit or and then this is why, because there's a lot of stuff goes involved. Uh, we're talking about just, you know, this and that, put them in, everything's good. There's a whole bunch of little little decisions that have to be made. So uh, mm -hmm. good point. Well, and I think what's by also me, interesting actually, today, the, it, in, in today's <laughs> times, right, um, people know a whole lot about uh, uh, plasma transfusions and antibodies, thanks COVID. Um, and so one of the other common things that I used to see in the emergency clinic was when we would have dogs that were severely ill with uh, parvo, right? They had the parvo viral enteritis. Um, occasionally, we would have uh, veterinarians who would want to give a plasma transfusion. Uh, so that's when you have just the proteins from the mm -hmm. blood, because if you have plasma and they do this on human medicine, if you have plasma that was collected from a dog that was vaccinated or had survived parvo, then they have the magic silver bullet in their blood, right? They have the antibodies to fight off the virus. And so you could transfuse them with the plasma. And there's a multitude of other things that happen too, right? Like you're giving them, um, what is that? On orthostatic support or uh, uh, what, what am I looking for here, Dr. Stone? Oncotic, oncotic, oncotic support. Oncotic mm -hmm. support, right? That's right. Which, is, which is not cancer support, it sounds like it, but it's not. Um, mm -hmm. But it helps, you know, hold the fluid in the, in the vessels where it's supposed to be. And so, um, yeah, so there's a lot of reasons you might use components instead of whole blood. Doesn't make whole blood wrong, but... You know, I just right. think it's awesome that we've progressed that far, uh, that, that we're, we're just moving forward with medicine. I think it's, it's really good. So it's not just, it's not just a tube to tube and, you know, dog to dog or putting yeah. milk in there, or sheep or whatever. <laughs> right. Uh, we're actually doing sophisticated stuff for, it's not like a shotgun. Hey, just take some of my good stuff and maybe you'll be better. It's like, we have very specific, yeah. um, you know, sniper type things to kind of attack what we want. I think that's, that's really good for the, for, for the industry. And now we have blood banks. I think that's really, I didn't even know that. That's really, mm -hmm. really cool. So I wonder if Vince Davern uses blood banks or if he's still got, you know, I'm sure he's retired or if he's still got the dogs there. So if he still question. uses the boxers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he doesn't, right? Obviously, but uh, yeah. I'm sure clinics do, right? Out in West Texas. They do. I mean, what are you, you going to do? It's the easiest, most simple thing. And, and yeah. you always have something there, right? So, and, and that can be very appropriate, right? Because right. in that situation, if you've got a, a healthy donor, it's been screened for all the diseases we want to rule out. Right. And you've got a patient that needs blood right now. Like an emergency could, for sure. Right. That Pivot. could be very yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Well, and that's so like my emergency clinic, we uh, had stuff on hand at all times. We had pack cells and we had plasma. Right. And um, but if we had a holiday weekend, um, you know, we'll and, that, huh? and I, yeah, and I, and I ran through it, then then we would move to donors. Right. Um, and I had a cat, the fat one, um, you know, she would come up and give blood. She didn't volunteer, but um you know, she came, she came, <laughs> um, but yeah, the fat one, she was a great if, blood donor. If you name me the fat one, I wouldn't volunteer for anything <laughs> any either. I don't blame that cat. The fat you one. knew the fat one. She I did, like, didn't name it though. <laughs> yeah. But you know, look, even being called the fat one, like I wish I had an ounce of her confidence on her worst day. That yeah. would be like my best day. She was a very right. confident kitty. Um, but anyway, so uh, yeah. So I, I think that that's, 
I think all of the options are good to have available because you just never know. Um, so yeah, so, so we're not saying that, that anyone is better than the other, but they are all definitely appropriate, um, at the time. Right. And you know, the, the challenge we run into typically is not being able to re- make the right decision with which product we want to use. Honestly, it comes down to availability. And you yes. mentioned that before, like, what if I'm out in a location where I don't get my next shipment of blood? Well, right. there are plenty of times where hospitals go to order blood from say a, a national blood bank and it's on back order. It's not yeah. available. Oh, or it may huh? not be available for several weeks, right. which doesn't help you. No, not then. Like, Today. Not right then and there. Right? Okay, buddy, come back and get sick in a couple of weeks. Yeah, we'll be ready for you. A few weeks. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't work out, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there is, there is an effort to increase awareness in the pet owning mm-hmm. population, uh, pet owning public that, hey, not only could your pet one day need a transfusion if one of these anemia scenarios happen, but also just like us as people, we, we have the opportunity to be donors. Our pets can actually be donors too. Again, yeah. so usually larger breed dogs that are healthy and um, depending upon your, your veterinarian and what they, they do, um, they right. may participate in this sort of activity and yep. um, give your pet an opportunity to be a donor. Yeah. And, and I think that's a good thing to point out too. So ask your vet, um, what's going on do with the, that. Do and the we, dogs get t-shirts also? <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. They oh. get treats. They get treats. treats. Oh, very good. Got to right. work for something, right? That's right. Um, cause that only works for treats. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the other thing we, we didn't mention either is that there are sometimes there's surgical reasons. So like if your dog's having a surgery or your dog or cat's having a surgery and, um, sometimes we know it's going to be one where they have a lot of blood loss and they may have a transfusion and they may let you know that that might happen. Right. Um, they had it ready for sure. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that in that way, you could put off a surgery potentially until such time as you have the the, uh, support available, but yeah. So, okay. So, um, I think we've hit on all the questions that I used to get all the time about, um, transfusions from pet owners. Um, Dr. Jason, did you have any other? No, questions? man, I think we covered, uh, as per the norm, our, our expert, not you, Dr. Jin, but our expert covered, uh, a, a wide variety of topics. And, and also I learned a ton or relearned it, or, you know, probably for the first time, but it's, it was really interesting. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, it was great. I don't have any other, how could I have any other questions? It just covered everything. I know. I, I have another question though. I mean, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I, but it I, has to, it has to pertain to blood stuff. Can't, <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, yes, it does. That's the rule. No, no. Like I just am wondering, Wait, um, uh, Richard, I'm going to remind you of the GOTM loyalty here. All right, go ahead. That, I was go ahead. Ask me a question. I was going to ask about the group of the month. Oh, what, what on earth were you going to ask about the group of the month? There's a group of the month situation, right? <laughs> Dr. Stone, was there, there was, you guys were a group of the month or you Absolutely. weren't? Absolutely. It was completely sanctioned. It was legitimate. <laughs> uh, it's not uh, like it's we good. took a picture and just put it on a wall somewhere in the vet school. No, there's it? photographic oh. proof. Like That's we, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so friends, friends, they're not telling the story all the way. Like, yes, we are. We okay. won group of the month and there was a photo to prove it. And there, were, there was three several, people voted. Several three people photos. voted. Three people and, voted. And it was unanimous. And it was, it was unanimous, unanimous that y'all were gonna, So, uh, you know, at most universities, they have uh, framed photos of people who've accomplished great things or who were selected by their peers to receive awards. Exactly. And, and the same is true at Texas A&M at the vet Correct. school there. Um, <clears throat> and so what Jason and Dr. Stone and another... Um, character uh that was a friend of theirs we can't we can't call out dr anders give me We're a gonna, break i'm gonna call dr cole Havy out right? all right i'm gonna say <clears throat> cousin anders was there <laughs> and uh yeah and they took a photo uh matching the uh other photos of people who'd been selected by their peers to receive awards and dressed up and and appeared to be the same and just hung it on the wall in the school as the group of the month, even though it was the janitor's closet, it was the door to the janitor's closet, but it still looked very official. Like I think think it's still there. In which case we are by right group of the month. I don't understand. (laughs) Why are all these nasty rumors going disparaging our fantastic feet? All right. I think we won that award four or five times. I don't know. Right. 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 At least four or five different pictures. So if you visit the anatomy lab, um, it, Texas A&M's College of Vet Med, and I think now Biomedical Sciences or something, um, you look closely at the group of the month uh, photos hanging uh, as you walk into the anatomy lab down that little hallway, 
And you may indeed see Dr. Stone and Dr. Jason Chatfield and Dr. Anders Colhavy. Yes. Piece of history. That's right. A little piece mm-hmm. of history. I love it. Well, and, and while Dr. Stone went on to bigger and better things at Blue Pearl, that is my one and only living legacy. So <laughs> I will cling to the group of the month. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Stone, Vice President of Medicine for Blue Pearl uh, Specialty and Emergency Care Pet Hospitals. Right. Is that right? Pretty close. Pretty close again. Thank you. All right. Horseshoes, you get a point. All right. I know. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. We we, uh, really appreciate it. And uh, for learning us up on some transfusion medicine, Uh, we'll put some links in the show notes for those of you listening. Um, And hopefully we can wrangle Dr. Stone back into the chat room to talk about other topics and give us some more dirt on Dr. Jason. We'd love to. There's no dirt to give. I don't know. I don't know why I keep this. (laughs) There is dirt. uh, there is no Dr. Stone. It was fantastic. Thank you for coming on. I know you guys are busy, uh, and we do appreciate the time. All right, yep. you guys have a good one. Good. All right, so All right. I'm Dr. Jen the Vet, and I'm Dr. Jason, and we'll catch you guys on the next episode. This episode of Chat with the Chatfields is brought to you by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements.